Today's lecture will be discussing medical nutrition therapy for cancer prevention, treatment, and recovery. So first, let's talk a little bit about the disease. So cancer is a class of diseases characterized by uncontrolled cell division and the ability of these cells to invade other tissues, either by direct growth into adjacent tissue, known as invasion, or by migration of cells to distant sites, metastasis. So this is a disorder of cell growth and regulation with no limits for cellular replication. Now the problem is, again, is that, again, it's not just that the cells are rapidly growing, it's the fact that because the cells have mutated, they serve no purpose. So for example, if you get a cancer in a muscle cell, we'll talk about sarcomas, etc. it's not like you just get extra strong with extra muscles. The problem is, is that because of the mutation and the change, the cells serve no purpose and are non-functional. So oncology is our study of all the forms of cancer, and an oncologist is a specialist who specializes in cancer. Now, if you as a dietitian are interested in becoming a specialist in cancer, there is a certified specialist in oncology nutrition. And so to qualify for that, you need to have worked as a dietitian for two years and have 2,000 hours of practice with oncology patients within the last five years. And there is an additional exam after the RD exam. And this exam must be retaken every five years uh, as it is updated for the new information when it comes to the treatment of cancer conditions. So most of this information you see is going to come from cancer.org, which is the American Cancer Society, which provides a lot of the data and the tracking on rates and occurrence. All right, let's take a look at some statistics regarding cancer. Um, so again, you can find these on the American Cancer Society website. So there's going to be approximately 1,800,950 new cancer cases are going to be diagnosed in 2020. And in 2020, about 606,520 Americans are projected to die of cancer which is approximately 1,660 people a day. So cancer remains the second most common cause of death in the U.S., accounting for nearly one of every four deaths, with more than two-thirds of cases in those 65 years of age and older. So the five-year relative survival rate for all cancers diagnosed between 2010 and 2016 is 67.4%, which is up from 49% in 1975 to 1977. Uh, and so this increase in survival is twofold. So this reflects both the progress in diagnosing certain cancers at an earlier stage and improvements in the treatment themselves. So we catch it earlier and we're better at treating it. And nearly 16.9 million children and adults with a history of cancer were alive as of January 1st, 2019 in the US. So one third or more of cancer deaths may be attributable to nutrition and lifestyle behaviors including things such as poor diet, physical inactivity, alcohol use, and being overweight and obese. Um, so an additional 171,000 deaths are caused by tobacco use. So again, we talk about the fact that lung cancer from tobacco use is really not that high because again, we have additional deaths. So they actually die again as a lifestyle choice before they would get cancer. Um, but if they had lived long enough, they would develop cancer. And so it's estimated that approximately 50 to 70 percent of cancer deaths are preventable. So the top 10 cancers resulting in most deaths per year. So we have cancer of the lungs and bronchus, colon and rectal cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, leukemia, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver and intrahepatic bile duct cancer, ovarian cancer, and esophageal cancer. And so here we can see, so estimated U.S. cancer deaths. So here you can see a breakdown of men and women. And so you can see a difference in location. So where, again, you see lots of similarities, um, but then also some distinct differences. And so here you can actually see the numbers broken down by percentages. So you can see estimated new cases and estimated deaths. So again, so you can see when we talk about the deadliest cancers versus right total occurrence of cancer. So how does Florida compare? So you can see, um, now I know the numbers themselves are a little small, so when you actually are not watching the slideshow, but um, while you're on the slide, you can actually uh, expand the image to see it better. Um, but what's nice about it is that it is color coded. And so you can see, so in this case, right, the blues are better. So you have the dark blue, the light blue, the yellow, the orange, and then the red is the highest rates of cancer. And so what you will notice is, is that 
uh, Florida is actually the light blue, which is the second best. Whereas you'll notice the states, right? So Alabama and Georgia are the second worst in the orange. Now, again, part of this has to do with health disparities, frequency, etc. Um, but what's interesting to me with Florida is that with such an, a large elderly population, I would have expected our rates of cancer and our incidence rates to be higher. But, right, part of this could be explained. Now, again, this is theoretical. But, for example, right, is that if you're healthy enough to move to Florida, then you probably don't have cancer and you're not sick, which would usually be a financial burden. And those people couldn't afford to move to Florida in retirement in the first place. So, um, I don't know, it's definitely some interesting uh, things to note. Uh, again, nothing definitive, but it's just interesting, like I said, considering that the neighboring states have much higher rates, um, I'm just a little surprised. So pathophysiology, so a carcinogen is a physical, chemical, or viral agent that induces cancer. And carcinogenesis, so the biologic multi-stage process in which normal cells are transformed into cancer cells. So cells in the GI tract and bone marrow have the highest rate of replication. And so again, when we take a look at cancers, right, this will start to make sense where, again, we're looking at the rate of cell replication. So oncogenes are altered genes that promote tumor growth and change programmed cell death or apoptosis. So remember that each cell, in essence, has a self-destruct button, which is if it feels itself starting to mutate, if there's a concern that the cell would be dangerous, right, it actually does have a self-destruct button. Uh, unfortunately, though, with cancerous cells, right, is that for some reason, this no longer functions. There are tumor suppressor genes, and so these can become deactivated in cancer cells, allowing cancer cells to grow. And so this is, for example, the mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes for breast cancer. Again, here what we're looking at is that the genes, when they would normally right, have suppressed tumor growth, are deactivated, which then allows for tumors to grow at higher rates. And all this has to do with is what's known as telomeres. So these are the end pieces of chromosomes that become shorter after each cell division. When the telomere shortens to a certain length, the cell stops dividing and basically it's run its course. And the, basically the easiest and one of the theories to describe with cancer is that things go wrong when we make copies of copies of copies of copies. Right, and so basically if I told you, you can only burn this CD 10 times and then it'll self-destruct or mutate. And so what happens though is, is that there's normally this built-in self-destruct mechanism after 10 copies. But what happens is, is that there's a mutation, then that telomere never sends the signal to destroy the original copy. So cancer cells reproduce at an uncontrolled rate to become autonomous from normal signals and even may secrete their own growth factors. In a cancer cell, an enzyme is secreted that destroys the telomere which leads to uncontrolled cellular replication. So again, it never gets the signal that it should self-destruct or stop replicating as there's no longer anything to send that signal. Physical characteristics of cancer cells are altered. So the nucleus and cytoplasm can be enlarged or misshapen and derangements appear in the chromosomal sequence. So again, it's not like if you got muscle cancer, you'd be like, oh, I have un unregulated muscle growth. I'm super strong. Right, the problem is that there's actually changes in the physical characteristics of the cancer cell, right, and they no longer function as normal. So there are three distinct processes to change a normal cell into a cancer cell. So we have initiation, which occurs as a result of exposure to an initiating agent such as tobacco, which predisposes the cell to genetic mutation and the DNA begins to change. We then have promotion where the initiated cells multiply and factors promote the cell's movement through the carcinogenic changes. So some, right, so some hormones right, may enhance this. So estrogen, testosterone, right, certain cancers are receptive to those hormones. And this can actually enhance or speed up the development of these abnormal cells. We then have progression where tumor cells aggregate and grow into a tumor, or the fancy word right, is a neoplasm. And so here you can see right in graphic form. So we have normal cells. With initiation, you see a few of the cells have changed, right? You can see that they have some double nucleus or some misshapen cell walls. You then see through promotion, right? This enhances the development, increasing the number of abnormal cells. And then what you see is you have tumor formation. And so you have either a benign tumor or a malignant tumor. So the benign tumor up top, right, is the self-contained uh, and it's probably formed a cyst around it. Um, and if you've ever had a dog live long enough, you've actually probably seen these. They're called lipomas. I mean, in which case, right, you see this type of lump in the dog, 
Um, but again, the, the doctor doesn't really do anything about it. it. We acknowledge that it's cancer, but again, because it doesn't have access to the blood supply, um, again, the anesthesia is more dangerous than trying to remove this lipoma. And that's kind of your benign cancer, where it's just kind of a lump. On the, on the image below, you have a malignant tumor, which again, you can see has actually come to the surface, as well as having access to blood supply, which means those cancerous cells can spread throughout the body. So a neoplasm, aka a tumor, right, requires several conditions to grow. And so the growth rate is dependent on age, sex, overall health, nutrition status, and immune function. The availability of an adequate blood supply for cancer cells will also determine how quickly the cancer will grow. Again, these are still cells, right? So they're still limited by the laws of cellular respiration metabolism. They need oxygen, right, to replicate. They need nutrients, which again is all supplied in the blood. And so cancer cells may grow locally, which is the primary site, or they may metastasize, which is, again, we saw in the previous slide where they have access to blood flow and have spread to a distant site. So looking at nutrition, so nutrition and diet contribute approximately 35% to causal factors for cancer. And the patterns of cancer, though, do vary from country to country. So again, um, the Japan versus U.S., again, where we both see cancer, but we see, again, uh, different types of cancer. And so part of that, so for example, if we're exposed to industrial pollution, uh, possible radiation, right? With So for example, the Fukushima reactor, right? So having that the water contaminated. So again, what you see is you see different patterns. So diets are complex though with thousands of chemicals in a normal diet, some known and unknown. But right, the traditional diet right, is gonna contain both inhibitors, which are things like antioxidants and phytochemicals, and things that enhance tumor production such as fats and PHAHs. And so again, ideally, right, you wanna have more, right, inhibitors than you do enhancers in your diet. So some examples of phytochemicals, these are things like lycopene, anthocyanins, lutein, sulforaphanes, right, et cetera. So these are all gonna be found in fruits and vegetables, where again, these aren't your traditional micronutrients that have known quantities, your vitamins, your minerals, et cetera. Uh, but again, they do play a role in health, cancer prevention, et cetera. And so the easiest solution, and this is why you'll see the famous campaign was eat five a day the color way. Again, you can see that these phytochemicals come in different colors of fruits and vegetables. So again, we want to encourage an intake of multiple different colors of fruits and vegetables. Now, again, this is just a link this does not mean causal. This doesn't mean everything has an identified mechanism. But again, this is what we observe, especially at population level data. So here we have research suggests links with red meats, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, fiber, vitamin D, saturated fat, trans fat, physical inactivity, alcohol, obesity, and high BMI, and food preparation methods, including smoking, salting, pickling, and high temperature cooking of meats. All right, so first we'll talk about alcohol. So alcohol is associated with increased risk for cancers of the mouth, pharynx, larynx, esophagus, lung, colon, rectum, liver, and breast. And so two to three drinks a day increases the risk by two to three times. And again, we know that alcoholism is often associated with malnutrition. So again, as we increase alcohol intake, it's likely that we're going to decrease fruits and vegetables, right, or that antioxidant intake. So our recommendation is to limit alcohol intake to two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women. Next, we'll take a look at energy intake and body weight. So obesity may account for 6% of all cancers, and obesity increases the risk of developing or dying of cancer. So bariatric surgery using gastric bypass may reduce cancer death by as much as 60%. And so excessive weight in adolescence is correlated with twice the likelihood of death for colon cancer as an adult. Now, overweight and obesity increase the risk of cancer recurrence and decrease the rate of survival. So our recommendation is 45 to 60 minutes of physical activity most days of the week and maintaining a reasonable body weight. Now, what we'll take a look at is so why we think obesity increases our risk of cancer. And so this is IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1. is a polypeptide secreted mainly by the liver that plays a role in normal growth and development. And so obesity, age, hyperlipidemia, and metabolic syndrome can cause an increase in circulating levels of IGF-1. 
And so IGF-1, so again, it's a growth-like factor, is thought to promote the growth or development of prostate, breast, lung, and colon cancer. And so IGF-1 may stimulate the growth of cancer cells and inhibit their death. And so what we do see is that IGF-1 secretion is actually increased when there's high levels of insulin. And so obesity intake of simple carbohydrates increase insulin resistance, which can lead to increased insulin levels, which then causes an increase in IGF-1 secretion. Taking a look at fat intake, so studies show a link between high fat diets and cancer. And so high fat diets generally contain significant amounts of meat. So we'll talk about PAAs and HCAs and are high in calories overall, leading to overweight and obesity. The saturated fat in red meat may be associated with increased risk of colorectal, endometrial, and possibly lymphoid and hematological cancers. Eating more omega-3 fatty acids in comparison to our omega-6 fatty acid ratio may reduce the risk of colon and prostate cancer. So our recommendation is to choose leaner red meats and consume smaller portions or choose alternatives such as legumes, poultry, or fish. So we'll take a look at fiber, carbohydrates, and glycemic index. So the studies on dietary fiber and cancer are inconsistent. However, the intake of dietary fiber can influence the intakes of meat, fat, and simple carbohydrates and fiber-rich foods are excellent sources of vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals. Which is to say, so if your diet's higher in fiber and fruits and vegetables, it's going to probably be lower in fat, meats, and simple carbs, right? So it's simply you can't have both. You're probably going to have one or the other. So if we're eating large amounts of salads, vegetables, etc., then we're probably not eating the other stuff. So non-nutritive and nutritive sweeteners. So the FDA has approved a sulfamine K aspartame, neotame, saccharin, and sucralose for use in food supply, and these are regulated as food additives. So again, these appear to be safe in moderation. So again, this stems from a fear previously of cyclamates, which was an artificial sweetener that was found to cause cancer that was then removed from the market. Um, but the current generation of non nutritive sweeteners appear to be safe. Stevia, blue agave, and sugar alcohols are relatively newer on the market, and there's actually less research on them when compared to your non nutritive sweeteners or food additives. But again, the recommendation is, is to use common sense. Again, nobody should be drinking 300 cans of diet soda a day, but in small quantities, again, they're going to be safer than the overweight or obesity that comes from drinking regular soda, sweet tea, lemonade, etc. Taking a look at protein. So most diets that are high in protein are also high in fat and low in fiber. So right, the, the typical American is not getting a high protein diet from chicken breast, pork loin, right? It's usually if it's high in protein, it's gonna be high in chicken nuggets, hamburgers, etc. So again, it's not really the protein itself, it's the fact that other nutrients come with it or the types that are commonly consumed. So tumor growth is suppressed by diets that contain levels of protein below that required for optimal growth and is enhanced by protein levels two to three times the amount required which again, all cells need protein to grow. So cancer cells will use protein to grow, but so will your own body. So again, our recommendation, so increase intake of plant foods and limit foods from animal sources. But specifically, we're looking at those higher fat, unhealthier choices. Again, this is chicken nuggets, chicken tenders, hamburgers, etc. Now looking at our food preparation methods. So smoked, grilled, and preserved foods. So nitrates are used as preservatives and are readily reduced to form nitrites, which interact with amines and amines to form N-nitroso compounds, or NOCs. And so these are nitrosamines and nitrosamides, which are known carcinogens. And nitrates can be found in smoked, salted, pickled, and processed meats. So again, what they do is they actually inhibit bacteria and mold growth. And so these NOCs are produced endogenously in the stomach and colon of people who eat large amounts of red meat. And diets, though high in vitamin C and phytochemicals, can retard the conversion all right, of these nitrites to NOCs. So again, what happens is, is that a high intake of vitamin C and other, right, so we're talking about fruits and vegetables, again, are actually going to protect this from happening. So in essence, when we're eating our foods off the grill, we also want to have our fruits and vegetables. So again, charring and cooking meat at high temps over an open flame, so 400 degrees or more, can cause the formation of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs, and heterocyclic amines, or HCAs, which again have a clear indication for carcinogen carcinogenicity. 
And so animal proteins that produce the greatest fat drippings have the highest PAA formation. So again, our fattier cuts of beef. And charcoal grilling produces more PAHs than flame gas. So our recommendation, so trimming the fat to reduce the drippings. We could use baking or roasting, but using a marinade, which may block HCAs from forming. So especially, right, we're looking at our antioxidants in rosemary, mint, basil, sage, and oregano. Pairing meats with vegetables, especially cruciferous ones, may help clear out DNA damaging compounds more quickly. And again, looking at the big picture, which is so grilled chicken or grilled beef, right, compared to right our fried chicken tenders, right, etc., is going to be a much better choice, right? And the obesity is going to be more likely to contribute to health issues. Now, looking at environmental exposure, so everyday activity exposes to chemicals in the air, water, food. And beverages so again we're going to want a good environmental history when we visit with our patients looking at long-term exposure to carbon monoxide heavy metals pesticides herbicides and occupational exposures again I think it's always very interesting so again we take a look at for example pesticides at the amount that the consumer is, con is exposed so right when you're buying your fruits and vegetables you wash your fruit and vegetables at home Versus, right, it, it's a little bit different if you actually work in the industry, right, and you're around it every single day in large quantities, that's much more dangerous, right? Same thing, right? So if you live in a place that has very poor air quality with lots of smog, so, right, so you're looking at China with poor environmental regulations. If you're looking at cities in the U.S. when we had poor regulations, again, you're looking at significant risk to the lungs when compared, right, to, to current risks. And so recommendations. Um, again, OSHA does what it can to try and protect workers and then, right, for you as a consumer, so again, that intake of antioxidants and nutrient-rich foods and avoiding those environments whenever possible. So higher serum vitamin D levels are associated with lower rates of colon, breast, ovarian, renal, pancreatic, and prostate cancer. Coffee may have a protective effect as well as green tea, which contains antioxidants and phenols. And higher folate intake is associated with decreased pancreatic cancer risk. Soy and isoflavones may protect against breast cancer prior to menopause. However, post-menopause, um, they're a little controversial. So again, depending on if it is an estrogen-sensitive uh, tumor, et cetera. So uh, it depends on the situation and the quantity intake. So fruits and vegetables, so again, found to be associated with lower risk in 128 out of 156 dietary studies. Increased consumption of fruits and vegetables is associated with lower risk of cancers of the oral cavity, esophagus, stomach, colon, rectum, and bladder. The evidence is less strong, though, for hormone-related cancers such as breast and prostate cancer. So, again, though, there's almost no side effect. There's no disadvantage to having the fruit and vegetable intake, and there's likely a strong advantage to having consistent fruit and vegetable intake. So things there's ongoing research around, so resveratrol, so again, we've actually looked at the specific antioxidant in grapes, berries, and red wine. Polyphenols found in fruits and vegetables, green tea, and curcumin. So we know that, again, curcumin, we know about it, and inflammation, and now we're looking at it more specifically as part of cancer prevention. So cancer prevention and screening. So we have two different things. We have primary prevention strategies and secondary prevention strategies. So primary prevention strategies are specific factors are identified as part of the cancer process, and these factors are acted upon to decrease their potential activity as a carcinogen, which is smoking, if you smoke long enough, right, will likely lead to lung cancer, so don't smoke, right? Getting significant UV damage to your skin increases your risk for getting skin cancer, wear sunscreen. Secondary prevention strategies are methods of early detection and intervention, so this is Right, when you go to your dermatologist for a yearly exam, right, this is your mammograms, this is your colonoscopies, right, where we pay attention and we look for things much sooner, right, or further ahead of time. So here you can see the cancer prevention recommendations from the American Cancer Society and the American Institute for Cancer Research. So signs and symptoms of cancer include changes in bowel habits or bladder function, a sore that does not heal, unusual bleeding or discharge, thickening or lump in the breast or other parts of the body, indigestion or trouble swallowing, obvious changes in a wart or mole, a nagging cough or hoarseness, also unexplained weight loss, poor appetite, fever, fatigue, pain, sweating, and white patches on the inside of the mouth or tongue. 
And so again, so the idea is that this acronym right forms caution, which again is signs to be aware of. Again, especially in male patients though, as cancer signs are often ignored, um, either explained away as the aging process uh, or some other disease state until they're much more severe. So things that we can look at, so biochemical data, so blood, urine, and other bodily fluids, biomarkers, so there are specific markers for tumors. So for example, PSA, CEA, CA125, and uh, BRCA. So these are elevated during cancer. So tumor imaging procedures, so MRI, CT, ultrasound, PET scans, mammograms, or bone scans, depending on the type of cancer. And so invasive techniques that we may perform biopsies, cytologic aspiration, which is when we're gonna go and drain some of the fluid with a needle for testing, laparoscopy or endoscopy. So tumors are classified according to a staging system. And so staging describes the extent or spread of a cancer at the time of diagnosis. And so proper staging is essential in determining the choices of therapy and in assessing prognosis. A cancer stage is based on the size or extent of the primary, which is the main tumor, and whether it is spread to nearby lymph nodes or other areas of the body. And so there are different staging systems to classify cancer. So we're going to be looking at the tumor node metastases staging system or TNM system. So T refers to the size of the tumor. N describes whether the cancer has spread to nearby lymph nodes, and if so, how many. And M shows whether the cancer has spread or metastasized to other organs of the body. Now from there, right, so from that total score, you'll get, so stage grouping includes one, two, three, and four, with four being the highest, and means more cancer and more severe cancer is present. Now a cancer stage does not change over time, even if the cancer progresses. So a cancer will always be the same stage it was when it was first found. And so what we're looking at, right, is this catalog where, so again, we want to determine and define the best techniques. So if we catch cancer early, this plan of care works 95% of the time. If we catch the cancer late, this is the plan we use instead. And so what we want to do is we want to keep that clear for medical records. So if you have a stage four, that gets better, right? It doesn't become a three, it's just a four that you recovered from. Or if you have a one and it gets worse, then we determine, right, this plan of care didn't work in this particular patient. But again, we wanna make sure that we have good records for determining the best plan of care, right, going forward. So tumors are named according to the tissue where they arise with the uh, suffix oma. So carcinomas are in epithelial tissue. Sarcomas are in connective tissue. Lymphomas are in lymphatic tissues. Gliomas are in glial cells of the central nervous system. And leukemias, I know it's not leukomas, but I don't make the rules. Leukemias, right, have to do with leukocytes or uh, in the bone marrow. So leukemia, again, you're looking at leukocytes or white blood cells. So again, it's a cancer of white blood cells in the bone marrow. Lymphoma is cancers that develop in the lymphatic system, the nodes, glands, and other organs. And myeloma originates in the plasma cells of the bone marrow and most frequently occurs in older adults. Now tumors may be solid or liquid. So again, we talked about that cytologic aspiration, which is a fancy word for saying we're gonna have to test the tumor, the liquid of the tumor. We've talked previously about malignant or benign. So again, depending on if the tumor is isolated, right? It might have a cyst around it or if the tumor has metastasized. And then acute versus chronic. So again, is this a recurrent cancer or right, is this treated? So for example, certain types of skin cancer, um, it truly is, right? Once they're removed by your dermatologist, that's all there is to it, right? They didn't have access to blood flow. They didn't go any deeper. Um, and so there's an acute versus, right? A more chronic recurring condition. Some common abbreviations that you'll see. So again, you'll see a history of cancer in the patient's chart, and then you may see these abbreviations. So ALL is acute lymphocytic leukemia. AML is acute myeloid leukemia. CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. Again, these are all cancers of the bone marrow and the blood, but again, from a nutrition standpoint, not as big of a difference as they may have a different medical treatment. You also have things like Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and MDS, which is myelodysplastic syndrome, which again, we talked about those syndromes and those diseases that you often see in the elderly population. 
So in children, cancer often involves tissues that are still growing. So for example, neuroblastomas and osteosarcomas. So things that are in bone tissue or in nerve cells, things that are rapidly dividing and growing. And so in adults, cancers often involve epithelial tissues lining internal and external surfaces of the body. For example, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. So the type of treatment is dependent on the location and size of the tumor and the initial health of the individual. So chemotherapy, so the chemotherapy is infused into the patient's body. So the circulation so that all of the cells of the body are exposed to the toxic or systemic effect. And this affects the rapidly dividing cells. So remember that cancerous cells are unregulated rapid cell growth, which is the actual target. But the side effect is, is this will affect all rapidly dividing cells, including the GI cells and hair cells, which is why you'll see the telltale symptoms of chemotherapy. Radiation uses high energy particles or waves to destroy or damage cancer cells. And then surgery, right, which is the classic, well, why don't we just cut it out? Which we will often do, right, but then we usually have other therapies alongside the surgery. And then we'll talk a little bit later about hematopoietic cell transplantation. So, and that's again, looking at different types of bone marrow transplants. So the goals of the treatment, it may be that we're going to attempt to cure or have a complete response to the treatment, which is completely cure or remove the cancer. Depending on the severity, it may just be to control, so extending life when a cure is not possible. Or it may be palliative care, where again, we're going to be relieving pain and managing symptoms of illness, lessen feelings of isolation, anxiety, and fear, and help maintain the patient's independence as long as possible. And eventually, right, looking at hospice care with end-of-life care, where again, we're not really treating the cancer itself so much as we're treating the patient, right, for the end-of-life care and making them as comfortable as possible. So from a nutrition standpoint, so screening and assessment, we're going to be looking at, so the subjective global assessment, anthropometric measurements with weight and weight changes, skin fold, and mid-arm circumference for that muscle mass. Biochemicals, so looking at labs and focusing on inflammation with albumin and CRP. Monitoring the patient for any medical tests or procedures. A nutrition-focused physical exam, looking at ascites, so especially if there's liver cancer. Any wasting, edema, or changes to the oral cavity, which we'll talk more about with radiation enteritis. Any treatments, therapy, or alternative medicine the patient is participating in. And again, a good quality food and nutrition-related history, focusing on appetite and current intakes. Determining energy needs. We would prefer to have indirect calorimetry, and I do know that Moffitt does use indirect calorimetry, but otherwise we can use the standardized equations, the MSJ. We need to consider though the patient's diagnosis. If they have other diseases, so people with heart disease do get cancer, people with diabetes do get cancer, and so on and so forth. So you have to take all of those factors into consideration. Does the patient have a fever or infection? Are they having any metabolic complications? Any anti-cancer therapies that would affect their nutrition needs? And again, what's the patient's long-term goals or the intent of the treatment? So here you can see an example of estimated energy needs in patients with cancer. And so what you can see is that usually, right, we're going to actually have increased needs with the exception of sepsis and obesity, or if somebody had well-controlled cancer with a normal metabolic. But most of the time, right, with cancer, we're worried about weight loss. We're trying to encourage weight gain or the patient's very stressed right from the treatment, so we're going to have increased caloric needs. Next, we'll take a look at protein. So we know that a patient with cancer is going to have increased needs to repair and rebuild tissues affected by the cancer therapy, as well as maintaining a healthy immune system. So if adequate energy is not provided, the body will use lean body mass as a fuel source. So when planning protein needs, we need to consider degree of malnutrition, the extent of the disease process, the degree of stress on the patient's body, and the patient's ability to metabolize and use protein. So for example, a patient with liver cancer, despite the need for higher protein intakes, may have some issues with a high protein intake being used effectively. So for our protein needs, a normal or maintenance or healthy patient, we typically recommend 0.8 to one gram per kilogram. So for a quote unquote normal or non-stressed cancer patient, we recommend one to 1.5 grams per kilogram. For bone marrow transplant or HCST, we recommend 1.5 to 2 grams per kilogram. And there may be increased protein needs with wasting or hypermetabolism at 1.5 to 2.5 grams per kilogram. 
hepatic or renal compromise. So again, a patient who's got some kind of renal disease, either as an underlying condition, or this could be due to the chemotherapy treatments themselves, or this could be the cancer of the liver, et cetera. So again, may have BUN approaching 100 milligrams per deciliter or elevated ammonia levels. Then again, we're going to need to decrease our protein to 0 0.5 to 0.8 grams per kilogram. For fluid considerations, the goal is to consider adequate hydration and electrolyte balance. So altered fluid balance can occur due to fevers, ascites, edema, fistulas, vomiting, diarrhea, IV therapy, impaired renal function, or diuretic use to correct those issues. So the general guidelines still apply of 30 to 35 milliliters per kilogram or one milliliter per kcal. And so we would use these guidelines and less, so similar to the metabolic stress patient that we all just examined, where we looked at they had a significant output from their fistula. Again, if it was high enough, or if somebody had an open wound from radiation therapy, then again, we'd want to increase. But if it's a quote unquote normal, which I know is a strange thing to say in a cancer patient, then again, we use a normal factor for our fluid intake. For vitamins and minerals, if the patient has poor PO intake, it's okay to take a supplement that provides up to about 100% of the DRIs, but we don't want to exceed 100% of the DRIs, so this is none of your quote-unquote high-potency vitamins, your animal packs, etc. As high-dose dietary supplementation can actually have cancer-promoting effects. And so in essence, what happens is, is that, um, especially in the stressed patient, is that the minerals actually cause oxidative damage and are actually more stressful to the patient's body. So we prefer that patients have a well-balanced diet whenever possible, getting their micronutrients from food instead of a supplement. And again, many oncology practitioners often ask patients to avoid the use of supplements during treatment. So for example, many of these high potency antioxidant containing formulas, th the idea is, is that chemotherapy will oxidize and destroy the cancer cells. So if somebody on chemotherapy then takes a high potency antioxidant containing vitamin, they actually stop the chemotherapy from working. Which of course you can, you can see why that would be a, a problem for practitioners as well as patients. So possible nutrition diagnoses include involuntary weight loss, increased energy needs, increased protein needs, altered GI function, inadequate oral food and beverage intake, swallowing difficulty, malnutrition, and undesirable food choices. So some example statements for intake. So malnutrition related to cancer cachexia as evidenced by temporal wasting and 8% weight loss in three months or altered GI function related to biweekly chemotherapy, as evidenced by nausea, vomiting, poor appetite, and mucositis, or intake of unsafe food related to exposure to contaminated food while neutropenic, as evidenced by hospitalization, diarrhea, and positive stool culture for salmonella. So cancer cachexia, which we'll talk about as a specific disease process, so this is a common cause of death in cancer patients. So this is characterized by generalized weakness, fever, tissue wasting, poor appetite, poor skin pallor, and weight loss. Now the problem is we don't actually understand exactly what causes it. So we see again this collection of symptoms, but again, it's not, we don't know what that tipping point is or what quote unquote triggers it. So what we see in these patients is increased CRP or inflammation, increased fibrinogen, white blood cell count, and our pro-inflammatory cytokines like tumor necrosis factor, interleukins one and six, and interferon. And so then we also have right, these metabolic alterations from again, this, this pro-inflammatory state, right? This stress response. Now, again, what we don't know is what was the tipping point and what triggered that stress response. So metabolic alterations lead to increased energy expenditure, increased loss of adipose tissue, and an increased loss of muscle mass. So the three phases of cancer cachexia, so we have pre-cachexia, moderate cachexia, and advanced cachexia. And so the severity depends on tumor-specific cachectic factors, so changes in taste and smell perception and therapy-induced side effects. So again, this affects the patient's ability to have nutrition intake, right, to counteract these hypermetabolic effects. So chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery can all exacerbate this cachexia. And cancer cachexia often worsens closer to the time of death and is present in 80% of cancer patients 
at time of death. And now again, you can see that this is on a continuum, but again, it's not necessarily linear where you can see the patient. Uh, they just slowly get worse and worse. Um, the first time you may see them, it may present very rapidly, they, right, because of their therapies or because of other complicating factors, it may escalate and get very sick very quickly. Um, but again, this is why the idea is that we know that, that there's a huge hypermetabolic shift in this, right, that catabolism of that lean body mass, that increased energy expenditure, which is why nutrition is so important in patients with cancer. So let's take a look at macronutrient metabolism. So again, we've talked about this a little bit, and you're going to notice that it looks very similar to when we quote unquote talk about the stress state from the previous chapter. So what we're going to see is with carbohydrate, we're going to see insulin resistance, increased glucosynthesis, gluconeogenesis, increased Cori cycle activity. So here lactate is converted back to glucose in the liver and decreased glucose tolerance and turnover. With protein, we're going to see a depletion of lean body mass due to protein breakdown and decreased protein synthesis. And with fat, we're going to see a loss of adipose tissue with increased lipid metabolism, decreased lipogenesis, and increased lipolysis. So let's take a look at macronutrient metabolism. So again, we've talked about this a little bit, and you're going to notice that it looks very similar to when we quote unquote talk about the stress state from the previous chapter. So what we're going to see is with carbohydrate, we're going to see insulin resistance, increased glucosynthesis, gluconeogenesis, increased Cori cycle activity. So here lactate is converted back to glucose in the liver and decreased glucose tolerance and turnover. With protein, we're going to see a depletion of lean body mass due to protein breakdown and decreased protein synthesis. And with fat, we're going to see a loss of adipose tissue with increased lipid metabolism, decreased lipogenesis, and increased lipolysis. Now again, looking at the medical treatments for cancer, so we've talked a little bit about this previously and taken a look at some of the major categories for treatment. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about surgery. So in a primary surgical procedure, right, then the surgery is going to be our only therapy or treatment. And again, this is pretty common, for example, when you see things like some of the more minor skin cancers where, again, we simply remove them and, and that's it, right? Especially if we've caught them early enough, um, then it's not a concern. It may be an adjuvant therapy, so chemoreductive therapy to reduce the size of the tumor, and then we, per we perform the surgery. So notice that, for example, if you've watched enough medical shows that we may need to shrink tumors that are in sensitive areas, such as around the spine or in the brain, we want to shrink them before removing them. We can do combination with surgical resection followed by radiation or chemotherapy. We may do a salvage procedure, so extensive surgery to treat a local reoccurrence after a less extensive primary approach. So for example, performing a mastectomy after a lumpectomy failed to treat the cancer, right? We have breast cancer recurrence. Or we may use palliative ther therapies or surgeries, which are gonna be used to ameliorate the disease or symptoms, but won't actually cure the cancer. So for example, with pancreatic cancer, we'll perform the Whipple procedure the Whipple procedure does not actually treat the cancer, but it does make the patient feel much better and extend their quality of life. So head and neck cancers, and especially after surgeries, may result in chewing and swallowing difficulty, altered taste, dry mouth, and speech difficulty. So again, these are typically going to be in patients that have a history of tobacco and alcohol abuse. These often require long-term enteral nutrition. And so this is what I actually participated in when I was an intern at Moffitt, was in the head and neck cancer program. So we basically just saw all of the patients who had head and neck cancers. So looking, for example, at esophageal cancer, this typically involves partial or total removal of the esophagus. Risk factors include tobacco use, alcohol abuse, Barrett's esophagus, and a diet low in fruits and vegetables. And these patients will often require a jejunostomy tube. Gastric cancer or stomach cancer. So the treatment involves a partial or total removal of the stomach or gastrectomy. Gastric cancers have a low survival rate of less than 25%. And there's often a history of recurrent H. pylori infections. Symptoms in patients with gastric cancer include dumping syndrome, malabsorption, early satiety, and nausea and vomiting. And so because of the change in the gastric tissue, right, we're looking at secretion of acid, so these patients are at risk for iron, folic acid, B12, calcium, and fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, 
and these patients will also typically require a J-tube. For intestinal cancers, surgical excision of parts of the small bowel, right, can affect digestion and absorption, so depending on where they occur in the intestines, again, we're going to remove the cancerous tissue, but again, this could be six inches, this could be several feet of bowel, so again, depending on if it's the jejunum, the duodenum, the ileum, etc., this can have an effect on nutrient absorption. Colorectal cancers are often treated with surgery, such as a colostomy and chemotherapy. Pancreatic cancers have a high mortality rate due to vague, nonspecific symptoms until they're very severe, with weight loss and poor appetite being common symptoms. So the Whipple procedure is a removal of the pancreatic head, duodenum, gallbladder, and bile duct, along with the placement of a jejunostomy. Again, these are not typically used and not do, do not wholly treat the cancer by themselves, but they do significantly improve a patient's quality of life. And again, pancreatic enzymes are likely to be supplemented, right, when, especially once you've removed part of the pancreas from the patient with small, frequent, low-fat meals to improve GI tolerance. So looking at a whole, so as, in addition to surgery, we'll take a look at chemotherapy. So these are medications that interrupt the different stages of cell cycle replication. And so these are most lethal to cells under continuous replication, i.e. cancer cells. Unfortunately, they also affect bone marrow hair follicle cells, and GI mucosa. Now, chemotherapy can be given systemically, uh, and so this affects malignant and normal cells, and so this is going to be, um, again, that it affects all the surrounding tissue, and so again, it can be given orally, so as medications such as tablets, intravenously, intraperitoneally, intravascular, or intrathecal, which again are different spaces, but again, I. In essence, what we're saying is you can swallow the meds, we can put them into an IV, or we can put them into the peritoneal cavity for intestinal cancers, etc. And again, these are some other spaces or membranes that they can be injected into. We may do combination chemotherapy or multi-agent chemotherapy. We may do chemotherapy before surgery, in which case our goal is to shrink the tumor and then perform the surgery. Or we may do it after surgery to again ensure that there's no traces of cancer left and to make sure that the surgery was successful in removing all of the cancer. So common side effects due to the toxicity, right? So again, chemotherapy affects all rapidly dividing cells with the focus being on cancerous cells or tumor cells, but it's also going to affect that rapidly dividing tissue. So because that tissue is affected, the common side effects of chemotherapy include neutropenia, thrombocytopenia or myelosuppression, anemia, diarrhea, mucositis, alopecia, which is hair loss, and then cardiotoxicity, neurotoxicity, and nephrotoxicity. And so again, we know these are known symptoms, but in essence, we're using them on these patients because it's the best we've got and it provides the best chance for survival. Um, I can tell you, so I do have a graduate that works at Moffitt. And so they have worked though with several patients who have been on experimental treatments and so we don't even know what the drug's going to do and so then they have had patients in the ICU experience these toxicity symptoms and again you would think as a dietitian right we're looking for the answer of well if if this happens then I treat this and if this happens I treat that and what you will find is right is that especially when you're looking at cutting edge research and experimental treatments there's not always a clear cut answer on what to do right so you're instead you're really trying to make the best decisions you can to treat your patient the best you can So looking at radiation treatment, so radiation is an alteration in cellular and nuclear material from electromagnetic rays and charged particles. Again, continuously proliferating cells are the most susceptible, but the toxicity of radiation therapy is localized to the region being irradiated, so it should only affect the tumors and nearby tissue. And so radiation therapy is most common treatment for head and neck cancer. So again, especially because these um, tissues may be deep, right, they're not on the surface, uh, and so you'll see them very commonly in neck cancers. Now you may have seen, depending on how much Gray's Anatomy you watch, there's a procedure known as gamma knife, which is really fancy sounding, but in essence all we do is, so for example, tumors that are in the brain in certain locations, and what we do is we use a, a very large number of low-powered lasers and focus them all onto a single focal point, which is going to be the tumor, so they don't damage all of the brain tissue except for the tumor because again you have multiple streams right of laser at that one location 
Um, I do think it's funny, though, because they would have you believe this is cutting edge, but Gamma Knife's been around probably almost a decade and a half now, um, although the TV show would have you believe it's brand new. But um, again, so that's trying to minimize the toxicity to nearby tissue. So radiation therapy can be administered internally or externally. So externally, this is done with a mega voltage machine. Um, and so it looks kind of like a souped up x-ray machine like you've ever been to um, the dentist. Uh, and so again, we're gonna use it to concentrate the, ex the, the radiation on a specific portion of the body. And then we have internally with brachytherapy, so the placement of radioactive sources within an existing body cavity in close proximity to the tumor or within the tumor itself. And this is used to treat cancers like the prostate and cervical cancers. And so the side effect though is that it's going to damage nearby tissue causing radiation enteritis or damage right to the, uh, to the enteral system. So here you can see an example of radiation enteritis. So again, you can see in the small window down below, you can see healthy tissue. And on the right, we know that enteritis is inflammation. And so what you're going to have is, right, is damaging uh, you're going to have damage to and inflammation to the small intestines, right, with uh, bleeding, discharge, etc. So some of the common adverse effects of radiation therapy include delayed wound healing, hair loss in the area being treated, fatigue, mucositis, dyscusia, xerostomia, dysphagia, odinophagia, severe esophagitis, dehydration, especially with head and neck therapies, and weight loss. And so again, what all this comes together to show you is that with radiation treatments, right, we're gonna have changes in taste, painful swallowing, a swollen throat, and it's gonna be hard for us to maintain hydration and food intake. We may also have radiation enteritis, fistulas, strictures, chronic malabsorption, and severe diarrhea. So there's gonna be more severe symptoms, right, they're gonna be affecting the intestines, right, or the enteral tract, and this is going to be due, again, especially to brachytherapy, right, when we have the radiation seeds that are actually inside, right, body cavities and damaging that nearby tissue. So enteral nutrition with a prophylactic PEG tube placement is very common, so patients that are expected to undergo radiation therapy for head and neck programs, we will often place a PEG before things are bad, knowing that, again, it's likely that several months into treatment this may be necessary. Parenteral nutrition may be warranted to prevent weight loss and correct electrolytes when bowel rest is needed. So if the radiation enteritis is severe enough or there's a fistula, then we may need to use parenteral nutrition to meet patients' nutrition needs. So long-term effects from radiation therapy. So again, you are not a human gecko. And what I mean by that is, is that when tissue is damaged or destroyed, it does not regrow. So the long-term effects of radiation therapy for head and neck programs. So again, if I use radiation to treat your neck, radiation is not that precise, right? It's not a millimeter machine. So what'll happen is it's very likely that you may get radiation damage also into your jaw or oral cavity. This puts you at increased risk. So if I damage your salivary glands, you will have dry mouth. So you may have permanent dry mouth or xerostomia, and you may have the increased risk from the dry mouth for dental caries. Because of the development of scar tissue and damage in the cheek or in the facial muscles, we may develop trismus, which is that inability to open the mouth fully. And long term, the worst case scenario is osteoradionecrosis of the jaw, which is that will completely kill off all of the cells in your jaw, leading to death and rotting of the bone tissue in your jaw, which is extremely uh, painful and requires surgery to remove the damaged jaw and rebuild, right? So then you have a combination uh, salvage, op uh, salvage operative procedure where they have to actually rebuild a jaw and they actually use a portion of the shin bone to then recreate a jaw bone. We may also use total body irradiation. This is used for when we're looking at so bone marrow transplants, so to eliminate malignant cells and to suppress the immune system, reducing the risk of rejection. So HCST is hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. And so this is a therapeutic option for those with hematological malignancies, AKA blood cancers, used primarily for chronic and acute leukemia, lymphoma, Hodgkin's disease, multiple myeloma, and myelodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. So most transplants now, though, actually use peripheral uh, blood stem cells as opposed to bone marrow. Um, so we still do bone marrow transplants, but you'll notice that the 
Bone marrow registry is an extremely short list when compared to other medical registries. One of the biggest problems is, is that testing for bone marrow transplants and for matching is extremely painful. Um, so for example, I'm sure many of you have donated blood before, it's relatively simple. And in the grand scheme of things, a very painless procedure, whereas being tested for bone marrow transplants and donations um, is a very painful procedure. So it has much less um, volunteering success. So we've actually now switched to peripheral blood stem cells whenever possible. So this HSCT may be obtained, so we do have allergenic transplants. So the, it's from a donor, and this donor can be related or unrelated. We have syngenic transplants from a genetically identical twin donor. And so autologous transplants are from the self. So for example, this is why you'll also see, and unfortunately Orlando does not have one, but for neonates, right, they may actually have a cord blood bank where they'll actually um, preserve the child's cord blood, or which contains stem cells for up to 20 years. Again, in the incidence of any type of diseases that require a stem cell transplant, again, you would have an autologous donor. So patients undergoing allergenic transplants are at the highest risk for transplant-related morbidity and mortality with complications of graft versus host disease because, again, because they're getting it from someone related or unrelated, but it's not going to be an exact match. That's the highest risk that they then may reject the transplant. So the process, stem cells are harvested from the donor or, the, uh, or patient, depending on if it's going to be autologous. Patient undergoes a conditioning regimen, which includes high dose chemotherapy or total body irradiation. And this is to provide immunosuppression and to destroy malignant cells. Again, common complications though include nausea, vomiting, mucositis, pancytopenia, fever, and infections associated with the conditioning regimen. Stem cells are then infused into the patient and that's in essence, quote unquote, our D-Day or day zero. So the day of the stem cell infusion is referred to as day zero. So for example, five days after a transplant, we have transplant day plus five. Three days prior to the transplant, right, we're counting down three days till. So negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, and then one, two, and so on and so forth. So all patients undergoing HSCT are considered at high nutritional risk. The signs and symptoms are similar to those for chemo. So mucositis can become very severe and develops in more than 75% of transplant patients. And parental nutrition has become the standard component of care. So enteral nutrition though is often not tolerated due to altered GI function. Um, again, so because of this entire total body radiation, right, it's very common that we will get the radiation enteritis. So one of the complications of HCST is graft versus host disease. So this only occurs in those receiving an allergenic transplant. And what happens is the donor cells react against the tissue of the recipient or host, i.e. because you have cells in your body that aren't from your body, your immune system may react and detect or identify that those cells are foreign. So we have acute graft versus host disease where rejection occurs in the first 100 days after a transplant but may occur as soon as seven to 10 days. So this may resolve or this may develop into a case of chronic graft versus host disease where rejection occurs after the 100 day mark. So nutrition related side effects of graft versus host disease include gastroenteritis, abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, poor appetite, weight loss, loss of lean body mass, malabsorption and nutritional deficiencies. So the patient may present with large volumes of secretory diarrhea, so more than a liter in volume, contributing to overall nitrogen and fluid loss. The patient will have elevated calorie and protein needs. Long-term complications of graft versus host disease include organ dysfunction, immunosuppression, and secondary infections. So the five phases of nutrition therapy for advancing a diet as tolerated. So again, we said that patient's gonna come in with that large volume of secretory diarrhea. So again, they're gonna have a very damaged intestinal tract. So the way the diet's advanced is we may initiate parenteral nutrition for total bowel rest. So again, enteral nutrition may not be tolerated with nausea, vomiting, severe mucositis, et cetera. So we're gonna basically do a total system reset and put nothing down the bowel. The second step is to reintroduce 
oral feeds of isoosmotic, low residue, lactose free beverages or supplements. And so this is in essence, right? You're, you're in essence drinking Jevity or possibly an Ensure, although the Ensure might be a little high in sugar. So again, low in fiber, lactose free. We know that there's going to be reduced absorption due to the intestinal villi being compromised. Step three is to reintroduce solid foods that contain low levels of lactose, fiber, fat, acidity, and no gastric irritants. Uh, so no black pepper, no chili pepper, uh, you know, nothing that would be irritating to the GI system. The fourth step, again, the dietary restrictions are progressively reduced. So again, we might slowly introduce fiber or fat, right, but not all at once. And then step five is when we finally are back to a completely regular diet. So the primary treatment for graft versus host disease is a high dose of immunosuppressant medications, including cyclosporines, tacrolimus, methotrexate, and or prednisone. So side effects seen within days though of this medication cocktail are gonna include hyperglycemia, nitrogen breakdown, hypertension, and sodium retention. And again, the same long-term complications that we see. So again, especially with a chronic case of graft versus host disease, where we see repeated need for these immunosuppressant regimens, we're going to see diabetes, osteoporosis, weight gain, muscle wasting, Cushing syndrome, and poor wound healing. So we've talked about the major modes of therapy, including surgery, radiation therapy, and chemotherapy. So here are a couple of the other therapies that can be used to treat cancers. So we have biotherapy, which are cancer treating drugs that stimulate the body's own immune system. These are given in combination with chemotherapy. And these drugs include things like cytokines, monoclonal antibodies, cancer vaccines, and hematopoietic growth factors. We have hormone therapies, which can slow or stop the growth of hormone-sensitive cancers, for example, breast and prostate cancers. Uh, the most famous drug in this category is tamoxifen. And we have anti-angiogenic therapy, which prevents or reduces the growth of new blood vessels to help prevent tumor invasion. And this is also used along with chemotherapy, where again, we said our major concern was that Blood vessels is what provides nutrients and oxygen to tumors, allowing them to grow more rapidly. So again, some of the side effects of these treatments. So we'll talk about nausea and vomiting, especially in relation to chemotherapy. So we have acute nausea and vomiting, which occurs within 24 hours after chemo, delayed nausea and vomiting, which occurs after 24 hours after chemo and may last up to a week. And then we actually have anticipatory nausea and vomiting. This actually occurs before initiation of chemo or during. So what happens is it actually takes time for the chemotherapy to have its effect on your system. So patients are usually not actually nauseous at the infusion center. But again, kind of like Pavlovian conditioning, where every time you go, every time you get the meds, you get nauseous or have vomiting, then you can actually, right in essence, your body's been trained to actually still have nausea and vomiting just by driving up to the facility or sitting in the chair. Nausea and vomiting may also be due to odor, other medications, or delayed gastric emptying. So there's actually an order at Moffitt when you can put on a patient's tray where they will actually, so if you've ever opened a to-go container, you'll know that it has a very distinctive smell and that's because the volatile molecules are actually trapped inside the container in the water vapor. And so what you do though is to help prevent that is they'll actually open the patient's tray outside of the room, wave it off a couple of times to actually get rid of that initial smell and then bring it into the patient's room to help with odor control. The treatment is antiemetics 30 to 45 minutes before meals. And so if you actually read the package insert, so Phenergan and, Zo and Zofran, the, probably the most famous antiemetics, um, they actually work best to take them prophylactically, which is you take them before you need them, not when you're extremely already extremely nauseous, especially because if you, if you have emesis and then the pill has not been digested, it doesn't work. So we want to avoid meals that are high fat, greasy, spicy, or foods with strong odors. And again, focusing on bland, soft, easy to digest foods on treatment days. Again, this is gonna be your white rice, your white breads, your white potatoes, chicken breast, nothing too spicy or plain pasta, etc. So diarrhea. So mucositis in the intestine can result in diarrhea, so that's inflammation of the mucous membranes. Dehydration can occur rapidly, so our treatment is anti-diarrheals and oral rehydration solutions. So right, this is your Gatorade, your World Health Organization formulas, your Pedialytes, etc. Consuming plenty of water and clear liquids and avoiding sugar containing foods and gums. 
Our patients were encouraged, so applesauce, bananas, canned peaches, white rice, and pasta. So again, here we're looking at pectin, so able to bind the stool, but we don't want any. So we want soluble fiber, but we don't want any insoluble fiber, which is very irritating to the gut. For constipation, we recommend an increase in the intake of high fiber foods with plenty of fluids, trying to eat and snack at the same time every day. So again, training regular bowel habit and attempting to increase physical activity as tolerated. Now, again, this could just be right a casual walk uh, around the block, or if you're in the hospital, right, several walks a day down the hallway. We're not saying it has to be anything intense. With patients that have early satiety, so this is due to delayed gastric emptying, small frequent meals, beverages between meals as we don't want them to take up space that could be food and other nutrition and then prokinetics may be useful to increase or speed up gastric emptying but again these can only be used for short periods of time due to their side effects so mucositis again we said is that inflammation of the mucous membranes so here irritation and inflammation of epithelial cells of the mucous membranes lining the gi tract now this can occur anywhere from mouth to anus 40 to 70% of those receiving chemotherapy will develop mucositis, and this occurs approximately five to seven days after the chemotherapy. Symptoms include burning and pain with chewing and swallowing. Treatments include oral glutamine. So again, we know that glutamine is the preferred fuel source for those enterocytes, so we wanna give them extra nutrients to help, grow, to help them grow and divide quickly. Narcotic analgesics for pain and topical therapies. So again, we can use narcotics. The other thing that we can use is actually as a topical pain reliever. Um, and so it's often referred to in chemotherapy or in cancer units as magic mouthwash. And so what it actually is, is it's known as viscous lidocaine. And so imagine the stuff that you've put on your back for a sunburn, right, lidocaine, uh, and then crank it up to 11. And so they create for you this um, almost gloopy, but then it's thick, but then they water it down into a mouthwash, um, like a, like a like a thin jelly. Uh, you put it in your mouth, you swish it around, and you spit it out, and your mouth will be completely numb. My mouth is numb. I can't feel anything. And they're like, good. Now while your mouth is numb, eat as much food and nutrition as you can while the pain's gone. Hurry. And then right, we want to encourage the patient to eat as much as possible. Now the problem is this will dull taste some. You can still get some of the sensations through smell, um, but it does allow the patient to maintain PO intake. Other things that will help is soft, moist foods, so extra sauces, dressings, gravies. One, they help ease the pain and help things slide along. They also have additional calories. So avoiding dry, rough, coarse, or fibrous foods. This is no time for a dry toast, uh, French bread, um, salads, right? None of that rough, spiky lettuce, etc., etc. Avoid acidic or spicy foods, which would be very irritating. Avoiding hot foods. Um, as well as in, um, avoiding cold foods, and when I say cold, extremely cold. So we want like chilled or room temperature. So again, the extremes are more painful. Encouraging liquids to avoid dehydration, high calorie, high protein supplements, and again, maintaining good oral hygiene. The biggest problem is, is that these people's mouths are very sore, so they don't wanna brush their teeth, which can then cause, again, we talked about those dental caries and other issues. So we wanna make sure that we actually maintain good oral hygiene, although it is very difficult in these patients. This is a very poor example. Here you can see the more extreme examples of mucositis, where you can see extreme inflammation and damage to the epithelial or the mucous membranes. So we've talked about it, we'll just review real quick. So zero stomia or dry mouth, so reduced saliva production or thickened saliva. So the treatment is artificial saliva substitutes, mouthwashes, lozenges, hard candies, and chewing gum, constantly sipping on liquids throughout the day, and then mildly tart foods may help stimulate saliva, but if there's open source, this is going to be more irritating. Soft, moist foods with extra sauces, dressings, and gravies will also help, and again, good oral hygiene. Again, we talked about on the previous slides, right, that risk of dental caries and other um, mouth issues. So dysgeusia, so we have alterations in taste. So chemo can cause a metallic taste or a goosia, so a lack of taste or a heightening of certain tastes. So one of the most common is, is that patients on chemotherapy will actually report that food is cloyingly sweet or so sweet it's painful. And so again, this is why you'll see the big difference. And if you take a look in your apps on your phone, or if you take a look online, 
You'll notice that it does say that Jevity can be used for oral intake, especially in those with altered taste perception. This is the population they're talking about where, so the difference in Ensure and Jevity is they both contain carbohydrates. One contains sugar, one does not. And so this is where, again, patients would actually taste the Ensure and say it's so sweet it hurts. And you'd be like, that's a very strange thing. But again, it's because of a side effect of the chemotherapy, in which case, right, the Jevity with its much blander taste um, actually does not cause that same sensation for them. Again, we still want to maintain good oral hygiene. Marinades and spices can mask strange flavors. So most famously, right, if you've ever cooked with rosemary, when you cook with rosemary, your food's going to taste like rosemary, um, which is good and bad, right? So if you don't want your food to taste like rosemary, that's very frustrating. But if you're trying to cover up the taste of, right, that, that coppery metallic taste, in which case, the, right, the rosemary could be very effective. Plastic utensils, so we avoid metallic utensils and trying cooler foods rather than warmer foods, right? If you've ever had a protein shake, you know colder things are always, right, less significant taste, right, harder to detect. So anorexia or poor appetite, this can lead to weight loss and cancer cachexia. Mild exercise may help, so it'll increase appetite. Appetite stimulants such as megase, or now that it's been legalized in this state, right, we could use a medical cannabis, which will help with both the nausea and the appetite. Small frequent meals, maximizing intake when appetite is normal. Eating some meals and snacks in a pleasant atmosphere, so again, leaving the hospital room, going to the dining room, right, trying to be a little more normal. Keeping favorite foods and nutrient-dense foods handy. If you've got a favorite food, we'll order takeout, and we'll order a lot of takeout. And then nutrition supplements, even if it's only two to four ounces at a time. So again, this may be something like MedPass, where again, we want you to take extra nutrition along with your meds. But again, our biggest goal is just to kind of sneak in calories. We're not trying to replace meals or meal replacement shakes or anything like that. We just want to add additional calories in addition to your regular meals. For weight loss, we want to eat small, more frequent, nutrient-dense meals and snacks, adding protein and calories to our favorite foods, using protein and calorie-containing supplements. So again, we want not just calories, although those are positive, but if we can add protein as well, that's beneficial. So, um, fortifying things. This is like where we added eggs where we can, adding dry, uh, non-fat dry milk powder into mashed potatoes, etc. We want to increase nutrient content as well. Keeping nutrient-dense foods close at hand and frequent snacking. All right, so now we'll talk about neutropenia. So here we have a decrease in absolute granulocyte or neutrophil count. And so the number of neutrophils is equal to the white blood cells times percent neutrophils, which includes percent bands and segs, which has to do with proteins in the blood and cells in the blood. But in essence, if somebody is neutropenic, if it's less than 500, then what we're looking at is so we have a decreased neutrophil or a white type of white blood cell count, in which case, right, you are, so the neutropenic diet eliminates foods that contain possibly infection causing organisms that could potentially infect an individual experiencing neutropenia. So in essence, it's a specific type of a loss of white blood cells that puts you at risk for infections. And so from a nutrition standpoint, we're most concerned about foodborne illness. So I know, right, you were thinking all that stuff that you would sort of say, finally, I never have to learn it again. I have bad news. Um, so you actually do. So this is all that stuff that you learned in serve safe. Turns out it is really important. Um, again, and these are the specific diseases that we are concerned about. So again, a low bacteria or neutropenic diet. So it's important to keep foods at a safe temperature and ensure proper hand washing. And so again, we're gonna avoid deli counter foods or cheeses. We're more specifically, right, just like a pregnant woman, they have to be heated to steaming hot. This is for listeria. So no soft or mold containing cheeses. So no blue cheese, right? This has to be from pasteurized enzyme-based cheeses, not from bacteria or mold-based cheeses. No raw undercooked meats, fish, pickled fish, or tofu. So again, it has to be fully cooked. Hot dogs, bacon, sausage, and deli meats, again, have to be heated until fully cooked. No raw vegetable sprouts, no unwashed fruits or vegetables. They have to be thoroughly washed. Fresh herbs and spices should be avoided, again, or if they're going to be used in a marinade fully cooked. 
no raw or unpasteurized honey, yogurt, and other dairy products with active cultures, raw eggs, so especially salad dressings, mayonnaise, etc., avoiding and watching dates thoroughly, and untested well water. So again, what we're trying to avoid is anything that could contain bacteria, funguses, molds, etc. So looking at nutrition support in these patients, so it is somewhat controversial. So considered an aggressive form of therapy and should only be utilized when other aggressive medical approaches are also being used. So this may be inappropriate for terminal cancer patients or patients with poor prognosis and all anti-cancer therapies have been exhausted. So again, it's one thing if we place the tube prophylactically, but it's different if, again, somebody's exhausted all their options and their treatments and they're going on hospice and they have six weeks to live, is now really the best time to do another procedure and get a feeding tube, right? Again, I can, we can keep people alive on tubes for a very long period of time, but again, these are discussions that need to be had with the patient before things become that dire. So the Aspen practice guidelines and nutrition support should not be used routinely in patients undergoing major cancer operation, receiving chemotherapy or radiation. Um, and again, there's some caveat to that, which is, so for example, head and neck cancers, we do place them prophylactically, um, but that's a little bit different because again, we're looking specifically at head and neck cancers, which will affect your ability to intake, again, from structural changes to your neck and throat. So we recommend that patients right, with cancer create advanced directives. So this is our legal documentation that guides the healthcare provider regarding specific wishes of patients during end of life. And so this outlines the medical treatments that are desired, including artificial nutrition. Again, consideration should be given to advanced directives. And these are activated by a certificate of terminal illness, which is where they have, right, the doctor has basically signed off. We've done everything we can, right? This will eventually kill the patient. And you would think, well, why am I doing this? I'm just the dietitian. Surely the case manager's involved in this. So we actually have a former student. And so they actually, uh, while well, they're actually working, so then they got a job. They basically had to run in and they were about to place a peg on a plate on a patient. And they had to run in and be like, stop the procedure. We can't do this because it turns out the patient did have advanced directives, but just nobody had asked. And so when the dietitian had been talking to the family and they go, oh, yeah, he, he wrote about this. And I, I think I saw it in this document. Turns out they had filed advanced directives, so they were in effect, um, and they said do not, they do not want any artificial nutrition of any kind. And so it's only because the dietitian took the time to ask that they found out about it, um, and they literally like stopped the hospital from a major lawsuit by going, hey, we can't do this procedure, like we have to stop. So complementary and integrative oncology. So again, complementary therapies, typically non-invasive, inexpensive. Useful in controlling symptoms and improving quality of life during and after cancer treatment. And so these are used in addition to conventional medicine. And so we'll talk about some of those. And then alternative medicine, so used instead of conventional anti-cancer treatment. These are often expensive and possibly harmful and may interfere with treatments or medications. So integrative medicine. So here we're going to differentiate between alternative therapies that are unproven and potentially unsafe and therapies that are evidence-based. So here we want to integrate evidence-based medicine, and so complementary therapies are going to be in addition to conventional cancer treatments. So this uses strategies to promote self-empowerment, individual responsibility, and lifestyle changes that can potentially reduce the risk for both cancer recurrence and second, secondary primary tumors. And more than 90% of cancer patients participate in complementary and alternative medicine either during or after treatment. So dietary supplements are the most common form of complementary alternative medicine used in the U.S. So these are used for symptom management and also for the hopes of tumor suppression. And approximately 35% of those receiving chemotherapy do not disclose the use of supplements with their healthcare provider. Um, and so that's why it's always very confusing to me, right? Because these are viewed by the patients being inexpensive or a natural alternative to prescription medications um, or right as a remedy to an underlying problem. So they think that's going to be strong enough to treat a condition but not strong enough to tell their doctor about. So like, I just never really understood that cognitive dissonance that, again, if you think it's strong enough, it's going to help this condition, you should probably tell your doctor because it's probably going to affect other treatments or medications. Now we also have, for example, though it's known as metabolic therapy. And so these practitioners claim that cancer is caused by an accumulation of toxins in the body. And if these toxins are removed, the body will heal itself naturally. So this involves detoxification, strengthening the immune system, 
and the use of special modalities to attack cancer. This can be things, for example, like colonic cleansing with coffee, wheatgrass, or other substances, special diets, vitamins, mineral supplements. Um, and again, so these have documented cases where they have killed the patient, so with complications of colonic irrigation, including electrolyte imbalance, toxic colitis, bowel perforation, and sepsis. Another example is the macrobiotic diet, so developed by Michio Kushi in the 1970s. So it claims that it can prevent and cure disease, including cancer, and that it can enhance spiritual and physical well-being. And so it combines elements of Buddhism with dietary principles based on simplicity and the avoidance of toxins that come from dairy products, meats, and oily foods. And so it's generally a vegetarian diet with 40-60% of calories coming from whole grains, 20-30% from vegetables, and the remainder from beans, sea vegetables, fruits, nuts, and white meat fish, and occasionally seafood poultry, red meat, eggs, or dairy. Um, so the diet is very low in calcium and B12, and again, has not been scientifically proven to treat or cure cancer. So here you can see though the macrobiotic diet if you wanna see, so the great pyramid, uh, the great life pyramid, and so again, how the foods are organized. So again, a very similar structure to what we used to use with the food guide pyramid, um, but again, with an emphasis on whole grains, vegetables, beans, and sea vegetables with then very little intake coming from any other food groups. So again, here we can see that right, cancer is quite complex. And so realize when we talk about cancer, um, again, we're really talking just more about general concepts and realizing that, right, and, th and this is why, so when people always wanna say we're looking for uh, the cure for cancer, and it's really not the, it's a cure. And so the problem is, is again, just the same way that you have hematologists who study blood, Right, you have gastroenterologists who study the stomach and the intestines. You have podiatrists who study the feet. You have dermatologists who study the skin. To pretend that skin cancer is the same as bone cancer, is the same as blood cancer, if that were all true, we wouldn't have doctors that practice in different professions. And so there's never going to be a single cure for cancer. It's going to be, eventually, we're going to find the best treatment for blood cancers, this specific blood cancer we will eventually find the best treatment for this type of bone cancer, and eventually the best treatment for this type of skin cancer. Um, but again, those are all different tissues. They all have different doctors, even in the healthy state, let alone in the unhealthy state. But eventually, right, the quest will continue. Right, we'll take a look in finding out what causes it. So again, what's that exposure early on? What's the best treatment? What's the best prevention? Um, but again, realizing that's a very multifaceted disease process. All right, so our practice questions. So compared with people with a healthy body weight, the overall risk of cancer in obese people is, and this is answer choice, B, higher. So again, we've talked about IGF-1, but again, so it is B, higher. Examples of dietary components that inhibit carcinogenesis include, and this is answer choice A, antioxidants, and phytochemicals. The best way to ensure intake variety of phytochemicals, and this is answer choice C, include fruits and vegetables of as many colors as possible. Remember the old campaign is eat five a day the color way. Patients who experience diarrhea and vomiting caused by chemotherapy or radiation therapy are at risk for, and this is answer choice D, fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Remember that is always our primary concern with vomiting and diarrhea is the electrolyte shifts, right? As that is the most dangerous component. And question five, if a cancer patient is using complementary and alternative therapies, the dietitian should do, and this is answer choice C, conduct a thorough assessment to determine the risks and benefits of complementary and alternative medicine. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions.